and uh, looking forward to it, brother. You Amen. go ahead. Praise Amen. the Lord. Uh, yeah, so uh, looking forward to getting to the message again tonight. Uh, but before that, I want to just uh, see if anybody had questions. I guess I'll maybe recap a little bit for to anybody who wasn't here this morning. Okay, there's a couple of people that weren't here this morning. So we are church planting missionaries in Napakiak, Alaska, um, in the Bethel region. Bethel region meaning that uh, Bethel is uh, 400 miles west of Anchorage by airplane only. It's out in the bush. Uh, Bethel region is one of the most unreached places in all of Alaska. It's the most remote and the most expensive place to live in probably all the United States. Um, so we are most remote in that you only can get there by airplane, and there's so hard to get uh, supplies and everything out there. Um, and that's the reason we have so, uh, so much expenses. Um, so just to buy diesel fuel for our house, you know, the uh, heating fuel, it's about $9 a gallon out there right now. Um, gas is about eight fifty a gallon, um, and ab gas is about uh, eleven fifty a gallon. So um, just think about us when you are filling your car up for $3.50 or $2 and whatever it is. Oh, we're buying diesel around here, so it's like $2.45 around here, I think. But uh, anyways, uh, it's expensive, and it's most unreached because uh, missionaries for years have been turned away from our region. One, because they can't get a job in the village because there is no jobs for them to get. And two, the people run them off because they come as missionaries. And uh, miss uh, the people out there don't like missionaries because missionaries came and changed them and took away their culture because the uh, uh, government came on the heels of the missionaries that came there. So missionaries are a bad thing out in our region. And they are, a lot of them are staunchly Catholic and Russian Orthodox and, and also Moravian. So they're very territorial of their uh, religion in that village and protective of it. Um, so they don't allow any other buddy to, anybody else to come in. But the Lord have blessed us with the, uh, that knowledge early on because we went in to do a construction job. And I realized that, and so I, when I went back, I didn't go back as a missionary, even though I did, but they didn't know that. I went back to be their friend and to reach out to them and offer them things. And we did VBS twice a year. We did Bible studies and church things and everything. And they still didn't see me as a missionary because I was different than most missionaries that came in there. So, and I determined that they didn't want to be changed even by the gospel. They didn't want to be changed, but God wanted them to change. And so over time, you know, God worked on their hearts and I'll share a little bit uh, story within three, after about three years was the first time we had a first convert. And we had about uh, 45, no, 42 saved up to today and 14 baptized. And there's 300 people living in our little village out there. So that's a, uh, we're a little big blessing. I know we're not focused on numbers or anything, but the Lord has been blessing. Um, it kind of helps us put in perspective, you know, that's almost 15% of the village. My prayer is 100% of the village is saved before I lay my head in the grave. Um, so the other thing that we have a burden for all this region, the region is the size of the state of Oregon. There's 56 communities. There's only three churches in those uh, communities. Actually, there's four, two churches because the one Bethel is not included in those 56 communities, if you, 57 if you include Bethel. Um, there is, Bethel is 6,500 people. It's a big hub. Alaska Airlines flies into Bethel. All the big old cargo planes fly into Bethel, and then everything goes out from there in push planes to all the villages. And we have an airstrip in every village. The government put an airstrip in so we can get supplies, medic back, all those things in and out of there. Um, so a part of that is the state helping us out. But there's 50 four more communities that don't have a church in there. There's our church, and there's my wife's brother-in-law, Israel Warren, started a church in St. Mary's, which is in our region. So there's only two churches, and both of those churches got started in 2016. We both started a church in, uh, he started in St. Mary's in October, and I started in Napakiak in uh, uh, May, when I moved out there in May of 2016. So uh, the Lord is working, and he's done a lot of miracles for us. I mean, just the fact that we're able to live in an Eskimo village is a miracle in itself because they've told me for years that you can't live 
in an Eskimo village because there, there's no private land, there's no way you can live here because we don't allow non-natives to live on our property. Well, they made an exception to their own rule. They not only leased us a piece of property, they gave us a, a, a building and then the native cor uh, tribe, which is a whole nother industry inside the village, which sort of governs the village and says what people can and cannot do, they gave us a letter of approval to be Napakiak residents, which is a miracle. And I know he can do that same miracle in many other villages in our region. So we are kind of like, my brother-in-law actually were over in St. Mary's, there's private land, so he was able to go in and buy a piece of property and start a church. But you can't do that in all the rest of these villages, so you kind of have to go in in a different way. And my wife and I have been sort of pioneers, if you were, going in, doing this as a new way, because there's no uh, missionaries have done this prior, because they close doors. You can't live here because you're non-native, and so they go away and go somewhere else in Alaska, and there's a lot of other places in Alaska that have been reached. Um, and there's 212, uh, sorry, 229 villages in Alaska, uh, 56 of those are in our community. Um, so there's quite a few other villages, but most of them have been reached out um, too. Um, trying to think if I should cover on anything. Um, just before I forget, I wanted just to thank you guys for allowing us to come here and be a blessing. Um, and thank you for being a blessing to us. We've been really encouraged and everything. I just wanted to mention again, the prayer cards on the back table. And also there's an iPad. If you would like to receive monthly emails to your own personal email, um, you just put your e name and email and we'll send you a monthly email with our update. So it'll say every month at the beginning of the month, you'll get an email from us just telling you about what the Lord is doing and the work. And so if you would rather, uh, if you want to do that, that would be great. If not, then that's fine too. Um, we're not trying to press anybody to put their email down. Um, it's not like you're subscribing to anything. But anyways, uh, the, I want to just open it up for a minute uh, or two, maybe about four or five minutes. Uh, do anybody have any questions uh, before I jump into the message? Yes. That's a good question. Uh, they do speak English. Most all the uh, villages um, speak English because part of what was taken away from them was their language. When So everybody in middle age, like 60, are pretty much all under that speak English. Now, if they're 80 and above, then they really don't speak English very well. Um, their second language is English, but uh, they do speak Yupik. Um, the younger people my age and under don't speak Yupik at all. They're all English. So the young people like don't understand the elders when they speak. They like turn them off. So it's part of the a uh, little bit of part of the problem why the young people hadn't been reached because in the church they mostly use Yupik, their language, and so the young people just don't even go because they don't understand it. Yes, B. How did you get uh, airfare? Or who takes you into Bethel or the village of Kingdom Air? Is that you that you raised? So Alaska Airlines flies from Anchorage to Bethel, and then we fly ourselves everywhere. Um, my wife and I are both pilots, and we both have we have two airplanes, um, and we fly uh, to these places because three months out of the year you cannot get to any of these villages but by air. I mean, three months out of the year because of freezing and fall, thawing and uh, breakup and stuff. But the other months, you can, some of the villages you can boat to, and some of them you can snow machine to. But other than that, there's no roads between any of these villages. There's just a village right in the middle of the tundra, no roads going to it. So. Right behind you, yeah. So, uh, yes and no. So it's one big Eskimo tribe. So Alaska split up in seven different uh, people groups. Uh, but there's our is central Yupik um, Eskimo. And then inside of every village, there's the Pakiak tribe. So they have their own name. Uh, but they're not like a different nationality or different. They just have their tribe that they're a part of. But each individual village has their own tribe. Um, and then there's a couple tribes out there that if you don't have a tribe to belong to, you can join up to that tribe. Like it's kind of like a catch-all tribe. Um, and that's mostly located in Bethel. Language that you're talking about, that you pick or whatever, have you been able to work on that with some of the older folks that are... 
Um, I have learned enough to um, uh, communicate with them with English and a little bit of Yupik. Um, it's a really tough uh, language because it's all from your throat and it's very guttural. I even went to college for one semester to learn the language and it was still a struggle. I got some of the basis. Um, and the problem is I'm not immersed in it enough. Like if it was like everybody spoke it around me and I was immersed in it, I'd probably learn it. But I can't get anyone to even teach me. So it's kind of like, it is sad because it's kind of a dying out language at the same time. Even though we have it written and stuff, the speaking is kind of like dying out, so. So everyone that I bring in is under me, under my name. And if someone I bring in goes out and does something bad, it under, it's goes on me. If they do something good, it goes on me too. So, uh, and, But they, tr they trust anyone that I bring in, pretty much. Um, it's actually quite scary, to be honest. Um, but if I bring someone in, I mean, they trust them, and they'll just have them into their home. And Oh, you, Joe brought you here? And like, so I got to be careful who I bring in. Um, but I'm not too worried about it e either because I think the Lord will protect us. And I, I talk to folks, and, you know, this is what you don't do. This is what you need to watch out. And we are inviting people to come up um, freely to come up and experience a short-term mission trip, come for a week or two and help us out. We got a lot of building projects. We got uh, passing out Bibles, gardening, VBS. There's a lot of different projects. We have a lot of young people coming this year, even still now we committed to come. And so we're excited about that. We need help. It's, it's a big problem out there not to have enough help. Yes, that's a good question. Um, there's a clinic there that staff sometimes. Um, and the clinic, all they can do is take your vitals and call the doctor and say, what's wrong with this guy? And then they say, he says, oh, he needs to be medevac to a Bethel. And, uh, and they call the medevac plane and you show, they show up four hours later. So that's the quick answer to your question. And the other answer is, yes, I have flown many a medical person to Bethel on the spur of the moment. For example, when I was living in Bethel before I moved down there, I caught a call from a dear friend in, in, the, in the Pakiak that um, he said, my dad is having a heart attack. He just passed out. He's completely out of it. We're trying to give him oxygen, trying to revive him. And I was like, I'll be there. And so I drove to the airport quickly, jumped in my plane, flew down there, and I got there in like 20 minutes. I, we got him loaded up, and I took him to um, Bethel, uh, to the emergency room. He was having a heart attack. Um, they then medevac him out to Anchorage because Bethel couldn't um, take care of him. They were just able to stabilize him and then get him out to Anchorage, which he had surgery. But they said the medevac was going to be four hours out because it was in another village and they had to bring delivery and then go down there and pick him up. So he, I almost sure you he would have died if I hadn't have been there for him. And there's been another, there was another story. Uh, I could sit here and tell you stories all night, but uh, when a lady, her water broke and she was gonna have her baby and she was in the village. She was supposed to be in Bethel, it was coming early. And uh, I couldn't fly out because the weather was so foggy, it was like, they. I couldn't get out at all. And so we put him in our boat, put her in our boat, and took her to the, up to the Bethel. But on almost to Bethel, we ran out of gas. <laughs> because we weren't really uh, planning on using my boat. And uh, I was supposed to gas it up to the next time I go out. Um, and I just, in emergency, put the boat in the water and took off and totally forgot about grabbing some gas. And uh, we were able to tip the boat on its side and get the last little bit out of the tank and make it to Bethel. And my wife drove, and she made it there without having the baby in the boat. But, uh, and the baby came fine, and she was fine and everything. But we were starting to wonder if she was going <laughs> to deliver a baby in the boat. So... <laughs>
But I got stories after stories about search and rescue and the airplanes and uh, snow machine search and rescue, saving lives. It's just a daily uh, occurrence for us. A couple more questions, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we have uh, some a Bible producer that's going to print uh, 15,000 Bibles for us. Um, they are going to cover all the costs for it. They're going to, and we already purchased a Connex with some donations to put those Bibles in. They're in Shelbyville, Tennessee. And then those Bibles will be shipped uh, from there over to Seattle and then Seattle up to Alaska. Now that shipping is going to be about $16,000, which we have to cover. We've had about $8,000 come in in funds towards that shipping. So we're still about $8,000 short. Um, but the Lord provided those Bibles. Um, they said it's going to cost them like $70,000 to print those Bibles just in materials. And they have donors that are committing to print that. So that's a huge, huge blessing. We're really excited about that. And the biggest reason we're doing the whole King James, um, the whole Bible, is that the people out there accept it. Catholics and Rus Rome, Russian Orthodox accept the Bible. I was telling him at lunch that they won't take a John and Romans. They won't take a tract. They won't take a New Testament, but they'll take a whole Bible. And they actually make sure that it was, it's a King James because they don't see it as a threat to their religion. They don't want anything to threaten their religion, what they already have. I guess Catholics in Russian Orthodox in our area don't see a King James as a threat to their own uh, religion. They just see it as an authentic word of God. Um, I almost felt like if I was NIV, they wouldn't even accept it. That's how I was getting a feeling to, when they checked to make sure it was a King James. Now, I've never tried to pass out an NIV, and I never will. But <laughs> so, <laughs> um, But yeah, one more question. Um, so the name of our church is the Armory of God Baptist Church. And the reason that is is because the building that we are living in and starting the church in is called the Armory Building. It was the National Guard Armory Building that the military came in and put in. For the life of that village, that building will be called the Armory Building. You cannot change that name. So I capitalized on the name. You see that? And so now it's going to be the Armory of God now. Uh, church instead, Armory of God Baptist Church instead of just the Armory. And so I'm capitalizing on that. The other thing is, uh, I'm not going to be translating Yupik, but we have a man in our church that will translate for me, um, that he was happy to, I've asked him to do some translate. Hey, how, can, how do you say that in your language? And he will explain it to people. And I, he's ra I'm raising him up to be the preacher and the pastor. Um, the, of that church in Apokiak, Lord willing. Or he might go to another village and start a church. One way or the other, he has a burden for the people and to be a pastor. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I would love to keep answering questions, but um, either you guys are here late or I answer more questions. <laughs> um, well, take your Bibles tonight and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we're going to be in verse 9 through, sorry, yeah, 9 through 15. Verse 9 through 15. In Romans chapter 10, in verse, starting in verse 9, it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture hath said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Dear Heavenly Father, come before you tonight. I thank you for your word of God. I pray you'll open it to us and you'll speak to our hearts and be here in your still small voice and open the scripture to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here tonight we're going to be talking about discipleship and evangelism and the importance of both of those. They have a place in church and out there. We see, starting in verse 9, that the gospel is laid out to us in a very straightforward way. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It jumps right to the heart. It starts in our heart. We have to believe that God has raised him from the dead. Why is it so important that God, we believe that God has raised him from the dead? Because if we do not believe that Jesus, God raised Jesus from the dead, then we don't believe he died on the cross. We don't believe that he was God. But if we do believe that, then we believe that he was God, that he died on the cross, and on the third day he rose again. It's so important that we believe that in our hearts. We have to first believe in the Lord Jesus in our heart. It starts with the heart. Deep down inside of us, we believe that we are a sinner and that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. What does Romans 6.23 say? It says, for the wages of sin is death. If you go out and work all day, you earn a wage for your work, right? What you did. One of our sins is enough to earn us the wage of death, eternal death forever and ever. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are excluded from that, right? If we owe the punishment of death for one of our sins, and Jesus took that death on the cross, then that means we no longer have to pay that death penalty. Jesus did what on the cross? He died. We owe death. Jesus took that death for us. So we no longer have to die and go to hell for that sin. But it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have to accept that gift. Christmas or your birthday, someone offered you a gift, right? They held out a gift and said, here, I got this for you. It's all wrapped up in a, a nice pretty paper. They offered that gift. You had a choice at that moment to reject that gift or to accept that gift. You had no idea what was inside that package. It could have been a squirrel. But instead, you said, I'm going to take, uh, the, the, I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to receive that gift that this person is offering me. Jesus Christ is offering every single human being on this earth a free gift. Every single buddy. No one is excluded. No one is excluded. But it is your choice and their choice to do what? To accept that gift of salvation by faith. You never saw Jesus die on the cross. You're not standing here claiming that you saw Jesus, that you saw him rise from the grave. None of us have. We accept it by faith. It's kind of like that gift that we unwrap. We don't know what's inside of it. When we accept Jesus Christ in our heart, we, don't we do not understand the fullness of Jesus when we accept Jesus. All we can do is believe that he did it for us. When we unwrap that gift of salvation, it becomes alive to us. And Jesus Christ becomes a part of us. And we take hold of that. And we take hold on eternal life. That eternal life brings us and makes us alive in Jesus. And that gives us that life and that joy. And I would say it's like opening the best, best Christmas gift ever in the world. We accept that by faith. 
that's what it's talking about here. This is what evangelism is. It's going out and telling someone about Jesus and them accepting the Lord Jesus into their heart. It says, and in verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So in our heart, we believe unto righteousness. What is righteousness? Being right before God. Break it down. Righteousness, rightness before God. There's only one way we can become right before God, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then it says, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What's two things we do with our mouth? We eat and we speak. This is talking about speaking, not eating. This is talking about confessing with our mouth, out loud confessing the Lord Jesus. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We open our mouth and we confess the Lord Jesus Christ once we believe it in our heart. That is the moment that we give our life to the Lord Jesus and we accept him. I believe that there is a time and place that each one of us should have in our lives where we gave our life to Jesus. If you are here tonight and you, and you cannot remember a time that you gave your life to Jesus, I'm not talking about the exact date. I got saved on September 28, 2006. I'm talking about remembering in your mind. I remember that I was on my knees in the laundry room and the lights were out and I was talking to my older brother and I gave my life to Jesus. It was a couple years later. I was like, I really want to know that date. And I went back and I found out what date that was. Now, since I got you all curious, I'm going to go ahead and share you my testimony. It was September 28, 2006. I was 14 years old. We were in our boys' bedroom, and one of my older brothers accidentally fired off a 454 Casul pistol. And it passed my head by one foot and went into the concrete wall and stopped. That shook me up. I think that would have shook any of us up. That blast going by your head, and I was leaning against the tape player, and the tape player on the speaker blew up, and shrapnel hit my face. I knew I was going to hell because I knew I had rejected God up until that point. And I was going to sleep after things settled down, and I was crying, and one of the oldest Buckingham brothers that adopted us got out of bed and called me out of the room, and he told me, uh, asked me what was the matter, and I told him I was scared to go to hell, and I didn't know how to get to heaven. And he explained to me salvation in this way. And I said, yes, I'm going to do that. And I got on my knees that very moment, and I poured my heart out to the Lord. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus that I believed on him, and I asked him forgiveness for my sins. And he came in and washed my sins away and filled my heart with joy. That gift I was talking about, he gave it to me. Amen. That presence was in my life, and I've never forgot about that. Never doubted it since. Amen. That is the moment in time that I remember I gave my life to the Lord. Can you tonight sit here and tell me a story? Maybe not this, of course not the same story because each one of us have our own story. Tell me, I got saved. My wife got saved in the back of a 15 passenger van. My dad was working on the back of a 15 passenger van and she crawled up in there and said, dad, I need to be saved. And she got saved when she was seven years old, right? Seven. That's her testimony. Each one of us have another testimony. Do you have a time and place that you gave your life to the Lord? Yeah. And are you willing to go out and have someone else share your testimony with someone else so they can have a time and place to do where they gave their life to the Lord? And then the scripture says in verse 11, For the scripture has said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That kind of hits us all square between the eyes, I think, yeah. at least for me. Because there's always, there's been a time and place where I have been scared to share my faith with the Lord. Scared to share Christ Jesus with, sorry, scared to share my faith with someone around us. Gone to that grocery store and we're just too busy. We've got to get somewhere. We've got to make a meeting. And we are ashamed to give the gospel to someone. He says, if we believe on him, we shall not be ashamed. Yeah. That's a commandment for us, that we should not be ashamed. And I'm not saying I'm exempt from this at all because I've had my place. We need to remember that if we have had the most miracle, amazing thing done in our life, that someone out there wants the same thing. Even though they don't maybe know it, they want to receive that gift. And you may be the one offering that gift. You may be the one holding out that gift to them. Yeah, good. And they will accept it. And they will experience the same thing you experience in your life. 
And then in 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is over all, over all is rich unto all. There is no difference between the Eskimos in Alaska and me. There's no difference between the Eskimos in Alaska and you. The Lord is the rich over all, and he wants to give them the exact same blessings that he gave you. This is after they got saved. Anyone can uh, get saved. The Lord is wanting to give that same benefit to everyone on earth. Sometimes we just, I've heard the word heathen. We've all heard that word. And we almost kind of think, oh, those heathens, we put ourselves above someone else. But the scripture is saying here, there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. There's no difference between the heathen and me because I was a heathen. I was a heathen, right? All of us were. And then it says in 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's saying that there is no stopping at God's mercy to anyone, God's grace. He can save anyone. Anyone can get saved. We say, oh, well, that guy that killed how many people in that mass shooting? Yes, sir, that's exactly right. He can save that person too. And he wants to save that person. He doesn't want anyone to spend uh, eternity in hell. But there is one that does, and that's Satan. And he will do everything to stop you from getting saved. He, if you're here tonight and you haven't given your life to the Lord, he will stop. He will do everything it takes for you to block this message out so you cannot hear it, so you will not accept him. He will do that. He is the counterfeit. He is creating religions against God that look like salvation, but they're not. So he can send people directly to hell till they can spend eternity in that death. You don't want to do that. That's a place not for us. And then in 14, it says, And how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? So they can't call upon the Lord if they don't believe it. And how shall they believe on him of, uh, sorry, of him, of, sorry, and how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? If they haven't heard, how can they believe? And if they can't hear without a preacher, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So if there's no preacher to go, they won't hear that word. And if a preacher is not sent out in verse 15, then they will never hear. So re reverse that. A preacher has to go out and preach the God's word. And when they preach God's word, people hear, right? And they hear it in their ears. And then it goes to their heart. And then they believe it in their heart. And then they call upon the Lord out loud with their mouth after they believe. It's a chain reaction. Every time it's a chain reaction. A preacher is sent out. But it starts with a preacher sent out. That's the local church. It starts with the local church, sending out preachers all over the world to preach God's word. You may not physically be able to go to Napakiak, Alaska, but you can send me. Yeah. And you don't have to be my sending church, as we say, but you can send me by being there behind me and supporting me. You can support somebody in Ghana, Africa. You can support somebody in Kenya or wherever. You can support someone. You can send them. You can enable them to preach the God's word. I want to go to all these villages and preach God's word, and I've been hindered because I have to work part-time to make a living to keep going. But if I have full, full support, I won't have to work anymore. And that work, that work that I was doing before is now going towards eternal souls. It's going towards eternal value because a local church was willing to say, hey, hey, I want to be behind you. I want to be supportive of what you're doing. And so by sending a local preacher out or you going out to preach or to tell your testimony, guy or woman, just going to your local town and telling your testimony. They will hear it in their ears, and then they will believe it in their heart, and then they will confess it with their mouth. Let's look at discipleship for a minute. What does that mean? Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, uh, 19 and 20. You guys probably all very well know this verse and have heard this verse many times. 
It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we have a commandment here. This is the Great Commission to go and to teach. Well, it, to go and to teach all nations and to baptize them. That's evangelism right there. We are to go, evangelize, teach, baptize, and once they get baptized, what are we to do? In verse 2, in verse, sorry, 20, it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. From the beginning of this book to the end of this book, we are commanded to teach. That is discipleship. Because if we teach the whole word of God, we are discipling someone. We are teaching them about the Lord. We are discipling them and helping them to grow in the Lord. Out there, we help the people by teaching them the simple stories of Moses and Adam and Abraham, all those stories. And we actually start with a lot of those. And we start with the beginning of the word of God. And when they start hearing and start uh, hearing about the Lord, this is people that are not saved at all. Then they all of a sudden realize, I don't understand that. And I'm having a hard time. I, I'm missing something. And I go, yes, you are. Let's go to New Testament. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. And I explain to them salvation. They go, oh, that's what I'm missing. And they get saved. Amen. They've been in church out there and hearing salvation for the last 75 years. Because honestly, the only thing that church teaches is salvation. You just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're good and you can go drink the rest of the week. That's what really what they believe. It's a dead, sal it's a dead faith. It doesn't have any basis or any bearing. It's completely dead. But when we came, people started getting saved. And realizing that their baby baptism didn't count for towards salvation. And that they needed something. Because what they saw, first of all, was in us. And then they saw us teaching the word. And they are like, I never heard that before. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll be uh, going through the New Testament, you know, in Hebrews and stuff. And it talks about uh, the, the prophets and Abraham and stuff. And I'll go, you guys know what that is? Huh? What, well, who is that? I'm like, oh, okay. Now this Bible study just got really long. And let's go back and tell them a story. Because they have to have the basis they, if they don't understand it. So it's teaching all the stuff in here. It's discipleship. If they're going to grow in the Lord and go on to tell somebody else, they need to know all of it. And uh, Luke chapter uh, 10 in verse 2 and 3, Luke chapter 10, it says, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Pray ye that the Lord of the, sorry, pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. We see here the lack of labors. We also see here that the harvest is truly great and it's ready. Out in our area, the people are starving for truth. They've been fed lies for hundreds of years. They are starving for the truth. They are open to hear. I've never been able to speak with someone that's so open and so willing to share, to hear God's word and sit down with a complete stranger and to just open the word of God. You go out here and I can't find anybody that even wants to listen to me, even wants to listen to my testimony, Harley. But you go out there and they will gladly sit down and listen to my testimony. They are ready and their harvest is truly great. There is a lot of hope for the people out there, but the labors are few. I'll share you a story. We were, uh, we planted the garden in, tw uh, we, so you saw that we planted a garden. I'm not going to go into details right now, but um, in 2021, we, har we planted that garden in the spring and we harvested it in September. So in September came, we went out to harvest the garden. We tried to get folks to come from other places to help us because not uh, we get people in the village to come out and help us, but we don't get a whole lot of help necessarily. We do, but it was the pandemic. 
And so people couldn't come to Napakiak because they were no outsiders weren't allowed in. And then people in Napakiak didn't want to socialize or to even come out and come in the garden to harvest the garden or, or stuff. And so we, my wife and I, and some teenagers and some young kids, we got together and we harvested as much as that garden as we possibly could. And then it, the ground started freezing, and I couldn't get any people to come out and uh, pick the potatoes. We only harvested like a third of the garden. And the other two-thirds, about 3,000 pounds or 4,000 pounds of potatoes, lay under the ground. We had a great harvest, what we pick, picked, but the rest we couldn't pick because we just couldn't physically do it. And I wasn't going to uh, break our backs trying to do it when nobody else wanted to come out and help. And so we... It froze. The ground froze. We couldn't pick the potatoes anymore. And about 4,000 pounds of potatoes lay under the ground um, for the winter, rotted away. Nobody ever benefited from them. And why? Because we didn't have enough laborers. Now, you probably already guessed where I'm going with this story. What about all the lost souls out there? What about all the lost souls that are represented in those potatoes? represented in those unharvested potatoes. The people didn't have to do a single thing but to come up and help unharvest them. The, we, we could have benefited from that harvest by just going to do it. It was already there. The great harvest was there. All we have to do is go labor and dig up those potatoes. A very small part of the work besides planting the garden, weeding it all throughout the year, watering it, all the work that was put into those potatoes they didn't even have to do. They just had to come pick them, and it was theirs. Food to eat. There is lost souls out there. Someone else already did all the work. God already did all the work. All he wants you to do is to harvest them. We need laborers to go into the field. We need more. And we, we pray for God to send someone out. Constantly we pray. We need help. We need help. We need more laborers. We pray that God will send missionaries to our area. We started a ministry called Forget Me Not Ministries. It supports my wife and I mainly to get place to place, but we want that to grow to help other missionaries come to our area and to charge churches in all these villages. We have a burden for 54 more villages that need a church. I physically probably will not be able to myself plant 54 more villages, churches in those villages. But if laborers come and I assist them in doing that, then I can be a blessing in getting those uh, done. And when I lay my head on the grave pillow, then I will rest, then I will know that I have done well done. Everything I can do for the Lord. I'm not going to care about what the world happens when I die, but when I get to heaven and I want to hear well done thou good and faithful servant I want to do everything I can to disciple because when I'm gone who's going to continue the work on the ones that I discipled that ones that listened the ones that I poured my life into what did Jesus do he focused on 12, believe, uh, 12 disciples but he vandalized to thousands he focused on those 12 because he knew those 12 would go out one betrayed him, but he knew that was going to happen as well. And then in, in uh, 10, verse 3, it says, Go your way. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. We are to go out regardless of the outcome, who, wolf, what wolves are out there to devour us. I'll share a story in, uh, about... In about three years into our ministry, we harvested the garden. We were being out there for about two weeks. I was living in Palmer at the time. I was going out there every other month. We were out there. We harvested the garden. We'd just done a whole week of VBS, and we were loading our boat up to our lug luggage in a boat to go to Bethel to fly Alaska Airlines back to Anchorage and drive out to Palmer. Well, we were loading our stuff up to go down to get in the boat, and kids started coming up from all over the place like they normally do. But this time they started asking us how to be saved. And pretty soon I was over here leading this one to Christ and one of my sisters over there, one of my sisters over there, one of my sister, and they were all over the place asking how to be saved. And before we got on that boat and left, there was eight souls saved. And that is a, it was absolutely amazing. All of a sudden, just a breakthrough. God just was working. We were late to our flight even, 
because we were leading souls to Christ. That didn't, that didn't matter. We got on that boat, and we were pulling away, and this is what hit me really hard. I look back, and all those kids are standing there on the bank waving enthusiastically. Eight of them just gave their lives to the Lord. And I thought this thought, lambs among wolves. They were brand new lambs that just gave their lives to the Lord, and yet they were returning to wolf, to the wolf den, their own parents. They wouldn't even share their faith with anybody because if they did, they'd probably get beat and thrown out to stay in the cold. They were wolves. They were lambs among wolves. And that broke my heart. That's when the burden to go to Napakiak got on me, came upon me. And that burden got so heavy, so strong, that I could not bear it. I started just going around every couple I could find, everyone that possibly could go out there. I just started begging someone to go out and disciple them to be there, to be their shepherd, to guide them. No one would take the burden. So the leaders in my church said, hey, why don't you go to Bethel, join the local Baptist church there, be a part of them, and then go down there on a weekly basis, disciple them, help them grow in the Lord. And I said, oh, really? I can do that as a single young man? And I was able to have accountability and be able to take somebody with me. I went down there, answered that call, and that burden went away. And it was answered with peace and joy. And I've never been so joyful in my life just serving the Lord where I'm at. I have that fulfillment and that joy that God wants me to have to, to know 100% sure that I'm where God wants me to be. Sheep among wolves is what we have all around us. That's why God gives us a pastor to pastor us. Yeah. Jesus is the great shepherd. Yeah. He has his under shepherds to guide the sheep and to direct them, to disciple the sheep. What does Peter, 1 Peter 5, 2 say? It says, feed the flock of God, which is among you. Take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. That's describing our past, your pastor. That's describing what I'm supposed to do for the people in Apokiak. We are to feed the flock of God. We are not to do it for filthy lucre, meaning for money. We are not to do it to get rich or to have lots of money. We are not to do it with constraint. In other words, I didn't see any of you guys drag your pastor in here today. He came in here willingly, right? Did you force him to be here? No, he's here willingly, as far as I can tell, right? <laughs> but uh, we're here because we want to feed the flock of God with a ready mind. Ready mind means ready, ready to do anything. And then in uh, John 2, I'm sorry, John 21, uh, 7, 17, John 21, 17, he says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Jesus was asking him the third time, Peter, do you love me? Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he asked him and he was confused because he knew deep down inside of his heart he loved Jesus with all of his heart. Do you know deep down inside of your heart right now that you love Jesus with all your heart? Amen. Do you know that? Well, if you know that, Jesus is telling you tonight, feed my sheep. I take from this that the greatest love that we can have for Jesus is to feed his sheep. The greatest love that we can ever demonstrate for what Jesus did for us, for his love for us, is to feed his sheep. And why was that so important to Jesus? Because if his disciples and Peter and them decided, oh, Jesus is gone, I'm not going to feed his sheep, I'm not going to do anything, the gospel would have died out, the Bible would have died out. If everyone chose to for, uh, forsake what Jesus taught them. But because he wanted to make sure that they took the word of God and went and discipled, he challenged Peter with the deepest love ever is to feed his sheep. And, G and Peter obeyed. 
And that's why we have the gospel today. Let's look it back in Romans chapter 10, and we'll finish up here. Romans chapter 10 and verse 15. In the last part of that verse, it says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God is saying here that he sees the one that preaches his word as a beautiful thing. How many of you would consider my feet as beautiful? You probably wouldn't, and I don't blame you. I see beauty when I look at my wife, but the Lord sees beauty when he looks at my life because he sees the word of God being taken. Why did he use the example of feet? Because feet move, feet go, feet obey. They take in God's word. He says, I see your feet as beautiful. Do you want to, a God to see you as beautiful today? Do you want to see God to look down from heaven and say, oh, that beautiful soul, that beautiful person, because you're taking God's word. Did you know you can open your home up to someone in the neighborhood that will never, ever step foot in this church? But you can open your home up. You can take them out for a meal. You can open the word of God up and share God's word. And they will get saved and discipled by you for a little bit. And they're like, oh, maybe that church is not so bad after all. And they'll come to church and they'll get over top, over top of that. But if, they, if you don't go and do it, they'll never hear God's word. We can't just say, oh, it's all the pastor's job. We can't just say, oh, it's the church's job. If they don't come to church, then they're hopeless. We cannot say that. You want your feet to be seen as beautiful today by God? Well, it's up to you to take God's word out to those that are around us. And he says that he will see you as a beautiful thing. If you will stand with me tonight, eyes closed, as we open it up for an invitation and the pastor comes I want to challenge you tonight. Consider what God wants to see you as. I really want to ask if anyone here tonight is lost. I laid the gospel out. You heard my testimony. If you do not have a time and place where you've given your life to the Lord, tonight is the night. Please don't turn down tonight because tomorrow may never come.